So welcome to the Daily Friday. My name is Michael Schimke. I'm the CEO of Scalefree. Um, we're running the session here every Friday at 11 o'clock uh, Central European Standard Time to allow you, the, the audience, to ask questions about data vault, data-driven um, technologies, data-driven solutions, and cloud computing, anything relevant in that regard. You can All questions are allowed. I just forget what I said. All these questions around this topic is allowed. So um, shoot them here in the chat, shoot them in the, in the Q&A function of this, of this tool. Uh, raise your hand if you want and you get voice. You can also use a form, which I show you after today's session, at least the link for that, where you can essentially upload your question and maybe upload some pictures if you want um, and so on. So it's it's cool. Um, if you receive multiple questions, I would cherry pick. That's what I did today. So we have a couple of questions at the moment and um, I'm going for one of those. And um, it's, yeah, it's time boxed uh, to make it a good uh, video for uploading. And if there's no questions at all, we will talk about cluster here in the back. Um, but we received a question today. So let's... Uh, let me just find it for you for this one. Um, so, we sorry, we received a question. Um, it's here, not on the tablet. I need a tablet today, so. All right. So, um, this is about reference hubs and effectivity satellites. Um, so, what they have is essentially master data, uh, customers, whatever, right? Customers, products, and so on. And um, they have... And they have references to reference reference tables. So let's say you have a product with a list price, and the list price is in a currency. And the currency is a, is a ISO tree code. So you want to refer to another table to get the descriptions for these um, ISO codes, essentially, these, these UR, USD codes, and so on. Um, and they decide to create hubs for that. And I want to discuss that one. Um, what are the options how to model reference data? Because that's also uh, important to understand how we link it then to your actual uh, raw data model, essentially, or to your data model. Um, so they created a um, essentially a, um, a hub and a satellite for the master data itself, for the product, let's say. And then they create a reference hub and create a link. And then they had some couple of options, a couple of questions. Essentially, that they have a satellite describing the master hub. Okay. Uh, so where should it be? Should it be on the master hub or should it be on a link between the master hub product and the reference um, table currencies? Um, they prefer the um, satellite on the hub. Yes, I would do this, the same if the, the the question is always, what is the descriptive attribute describing? Is it describing the product code, the business key of the product? Then it belongs to the hub. If it's describing the relationship um, for the um, between the, the product and the um, reference code, then it belongs to the link. So then you would attach it into a satellite attached to the link, essentially. Um, but if it's just descriptive data for the product, I would just attach it to the hub as well. And then the question comes up, what if the assignment changes? That's uh, the, the assignment between, between the reference code and the product, for example, the master data changes. For example, if the list price is now in the next load in a different currency, then we have a change. Um, on the, we, we get a new link entry, and now we have to essentially do something, here, right? Maybe some FQ seller, for example. Well, the solution is much much simpler, to be honest. All right. So the solution is much, much more simple. Now, we model master data, products, customers, and so on as hubs and their satellites. So we have a hub. We have a hub, for example, for products. And the satellite describes the product as well. And from the source, you get some, um, some reference codes. Let's say the, the currency symbols, EUR, for example. Those currency symbols, we can explain further. And there's a couple of options how we do this. The most simple and traditional option is to create what we call a reference table. In reference table, the code is the primary key. And then you got descriptions. You got, let's say, the sort order, the caption, abbreviation, and so on, flat and wide. The primary key is the code. That's what you get from the source, typically uh, the, the EUR code, for example, um, or USD and so on. And then, and then you have descriptive data describing the code essentially that's the basic idea in this case you have the the code you receive that as part of your descriptive data for the product from the source system anyway and if you consider the the currency codes as reference data you're considering the currency codes as descriptive data as well um, and that means the currency code is just part of the satellite so i have here a currency with two r's so uh, you have to the currency code comes from the source, just add it to the satellite because it describes your product. That's the basic idea. Well, 
you would have now EUR or USD in your in your data in the satellite. If you want to know more details, you have to join the reference table for all the details. What's behind EUR? What's behind USD? What's the sort order? What's the caption? And the default color and so on. That's the most basic design. That's it. There is no re relationship. There's no foreign key. Uh, you could create a foreign key from a reference table. If sorry, from from the satellite holding a reference code to the reference table. We don't do that because there are scenarios where you have um, uh, code mappings. Let's say you have ISO 3 countries and ISO 2 countries. There might be another code here, uh, maybe an internal code that we define for currencies. Let's say an integer value, int code. That's internal code. Um, and I want to map the codes. I received the internal code from the source, but I want to replace it by the, um, by the official code that we want to use downstream, the ISO 3 code of the currency. Well, um, in this case, I need to join from the satellites with the internal code. I need to join not to the primary key, but to the to, the, to some alternate key essentially. Um, and that's a that's a problem. Um, first of all, the this might not be completely unique. There might be duplicate mappings to one uh, code and to, to one primary key, and you can't create a foreign key to a non-primary key column. That's one problem. So at least in most relational database systems, and that's why we typically don't model these foreign keys. We just don't have them. All right, so that's number one. Um, let me just clear this up. We don't have that. Let's get rid of it. All right. Um, if you if you want to keep track of changes, um, we got a problem here because in order to keep track of changes, we have to update the reference table now, update the the caption, for example, and so on. And that's a bummer because we want to keep track of all the changes. So the the first idea was to essentially offload some of the attributes into a satellite. We call this a reference satellite. A reference satellite is very similar to a standard satellite. However, the primary key, you don't have a hash key in the parent, right? The code is the primary key in the parent. So the, the, the primary key of the satellite would be the code from the parent and typically the load date timestamp. And then you move all the attributes you want to keep track changes for, you move into the satellite essentially. So you get a caption here. We got the abbreviation here, let's say. For sort order and uh, the internal code, I don't want to keep track changes. That's what it is, right? So if there would be a change, I still have to run the update on the reference table. But for all the attributes I put into the satellite, I can tr keep track of changes to my reference data now. That's a cool thing. Now, that leads to the extreme version where we move all the attributes into the satellite. Because nowadays, first of all, we want to keep track of all the changes typically. And for auditing reasons, we must make sure that we can reconstruct a report as it was delivered to the business user three months ago, three years ago. And if you update something here, you're losing the colors that you used back then or the sort orders and so on. So the report might change. And that's why typically we move all the attributes into the satellite. And then we talk, we, we, ca we call this reference table with just the code in it. We call reference hub. That's the idea. And that's a typical design. We have typically a reference hub with a reference satellite. Now, with that in mind, let's think about this. How do we now create a link? Well, there's no link between a satellite in a raw data vault or, or, the, or the parent hub. Uh, this was the parent hub here. There's no link between the parent hub product and the reference hub. What happens is you still have the code currency in your satellite describing the product. And if you want to know more details, what's behind EUR, you still just join the reference table, or in this case, the extreme version of the reference hub. You just join it. You could join it on the um, to, uh, on the uh, on the um, on the reference hub directly. Well, what what for? That's just the code, right? So we have that code already. So what we typically do is we join from the satellite here into this satellite. Select the right, maybe that maybe the latest load date I'm sent. That's the latest description, and go for the descriptions essentially. That's the basic idea. So there's no link in between. Um, you just join from the satellite describing a product. You join the reference data to describe the the the, 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 the reference codes. If something changes, if the list price changes, well, you get a change here, right? So you get a second row in the satellite, a new delta, valid from a given load date, replacing the previous uh, delta essentially, and that has the new description, the new code, um, the now in US dollars. So if you want to know what's behind USD, just join the reference table, and that's it. So that's the basic idea. So there's no there's no link in between, and that, that's why there's also no need for an FTT satellite in any way. Um, you just join the data by code. Remember, the goal was of the, to why we introduce reference tables and reference hubs and satellites 
the goal, the intention is to, to reduce the complexity of the data model. That's the basic idea. So for the reference data you have, we just create a simplified entities, let's say. That's the basic idea. Yeah, that's the, sorry for the long answer, but that's what it is. So um, you, 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 ra you raised the question here. So um, there's no link between reference tables and reference, um, or reference tables and uh, hubs, essentially. We just join the code, the, the, the script of data to the code. That's that's the basic idea. There's one question here from the audience. Um, a tricky question about ingestion data vaults. So let's let's read this. We have an ingest. Let me just show it to you. Uh, answer live. So we have an ingestion of a table loaded in in a full method. Okay, no incremental. Where some data in the in the past changes. Okay. Yep. It is transactional table where stock is corrected. So you okay. So you have a, a like um. Like, like retail transactions or uh, movements into a warehouse and uh, deltas into warehouse, that kind of stuff, I assume. So people purchase stuff and that essentially reduces the stock or when you get new products into the warehouse, there's also a transaction record that increases the, the, the stock. That's my assumption now. Is this use case supported well in data vault methodology? Yes, it is. Um, I have to fear the satellite table will become a big overtime. The, the query cost will become very high. I do not know... Yet, if it's important to keep the history of the old records because data is not relevant. Okay, so the, the, the quick design for this type of data, for this transactional type of data, is a non history satellite where you keep track of every record, every transaction, every fact from the source as one record in the non history satellite, a non history link. And, um, and if there are corrections, I mean, if you just correct your stock levels by aggregating, that's easy. Just load the facts into the um, non history link. And then aggregate the data and you know your current stock level. That's the basic idea. But if they modify the transactions, and I think that's what you wrote, you get a full load where some data in the past changes. Um, what we do is um, if your transactions, if your transactions change over time, um, first of all, you have to recognize it the change. And that because that, that's a bummer time sometimes if you don't get a change, right? Um, if, if you have to guess or something. But let's assume you get the changes. In this case, what you do is you introduce what we call technical counter transactions to the link. Um, so you essentially you you um, you introduce a delta record. Well, I would do, always introduce two delta records: one to get rid of the old fact, one to insert the new fact, and then um, um, essentially um, aggregate the the changes out. So you just aggregate on those records and get the current state for a given load data stamp. The cool thing is you can go back and forth in history and see what is the what are the stock levels with all these corrections. What is the stock level today? What is the stock level yesterday? What, how you look at it yesterday? What was the truth yesterday, the day before, and so on? It's a cool thing. I believe we have a couple of recordings on this one already. So check out the YouTube channel um, because there are some recordings. Uh, search for non this link or come to the training. That's We typically discuss this pattern, essentially. All right. If you have a question like this, um, shoot it here to the to the uh, to the form. Go to sfr.ee slash EV Friday. That's where you can essentially submit your questions, upload some pictures, diagrams if you want. Um, always upload your di diagrams in a form I can read. So a PNG, for example. I can also easily drop this here. There's also two more webinars, one on um Westgate and one on DBT. So check out scalefree.to slash webinars. That's where you find essentially the registration for those those webinars, essentially. Or go to scalefree.com, that's where you find also those those webinars. And also make sure if you have more questions, and because I'm answering here only, come on, move. There you go. I'm answering only one question at a time, sometimes two, like today. But um, if you have more questions, join the Data World Innovators community that we set up essentially with ignition, ignitions. Yeah, ignition, sorry. Ignition uh, in Australia. So um, come on there. Um, it's a forum, uh, forum style where we answer questions and um, yeah. Would be nice to see you there and um, get quick answers. We also have a monthly call um, where we answer more questions in a live stream. That's it's also cool. So it's very a bit similar to this one, but more questions essentially and in a, in a more discussion style. So um, yeah, check it out. It's free. Just join and um, yeah, would be nice to see you there. All right, cool. So thanks for the question today. Um, hope you enjoyed it and yeah, enjoy your weekends and see you hopefully next Friday. Thank you guys. Bye bye. Thanks for joining today. If you'd like to discuss this further, give us a call on the number below here and we're happy to discuss this with you. See you next time. Have a nice weekend. Bye-bye.